Hello, 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 Dr. Marian Nella Medrano. How hello, are you? And Sima, I am very happy to be here. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to see you. You know, you and I have um, a visit uh, that we've postponed for many years now. <laughs> right. So we're going to make it happen this year. Right? Yes, yes, we, definitely. Yes. You and I know each other uh, quite well. And we have uh, some shared interests. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to share some thought or? Yeah, well, the first thing what brought us together, which was transpersonal psychology. Right. We met in California. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, uh, to me a great, I remember the, the first time I saw your face and I felt at home. Oh I my felt goodness. Totally connected. I was there, I was in California, not knowing many people. And right. there was this friendly face. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. Then poetry unites right. us. Um, we both share the love and the cultivation of poetry. Mm -hmm. And we both she had so many things, uh, the spiritual life, mm -hmm. our interest in um, changing the world, right? Right. <laughs> and you know, to that, to witnessing what's happening and changing it. Oh, I remember uh, the first time I saw you too. And we both uh, coming from Connecticut, but we didn't yeah. know it. We met in California instead. Yeah. So that was... Um, um, very interesting for me, but one thing I remember clearly was I wrote a poem mm. uh, called Tumpala yes. at Mount Madonna. Yes. And I remember you said to me, I was trying to explain what the poem was about. Mm. And you said to me, uh uh, just 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 go with this, just go with it. They'll get it. They'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> They'll get it. And and you know, um, we had a, I think, a small group session mm -hmm. with, you know, some of our classmates, et cetera. Yes. And, you know, I, we did a reading, I think, mm -hmm. of poetry that afternoon, so. Yeah, well, we used to do that and then dancing. <laughs> exactly, ah, <laughs> that that's was our way to, that's to <laughs> kind of rest um, from too much sitting and meditating. Right. <laughs> Yes, Madonna was the place, you know, you uh, kind of get there, you know, you have to turn things down completely, right? Completely. That was, that was such a, a special place for my formation right. as, a, as a therapist. And, and also, um, it was a, a very affirming place in terms of my connection to nature, to um, the first time I went to Mount Madonna, I actually went on for a long walk and I got lost. <laughs> I was lost for hours in the redwoods, but um, finally I found my way back. I actually wrote a, an essay about, an article about that experience because it was kind of transformative to right. be lost there and at the beginning of a journey. Right. Was yeah. the, yeah, that, that, that was a unique uh, place. And also mm -hmm. talking about our spiritual um, mm -hmm. practices, uh, especially at, you know, with a group of people sharing similar interests was really, mm -hmm. really powerful. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, whilst we're talking about poetry um, and, you know, we, you are on the National Association of Poetry. Um, therapy. Mm -hmm. Therapy, yes. Um, yeah. Could you um, share how you got there and, you know, what you do? Yeah. Um, well, I'm currently the president of the National Association for Poetry Therapy and APT, which is an organization that is um, uh, the, 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 the vision and mission of the organization is to disseminate uh, poetry therapy as a means to um, facilitate healing and personal growth and development through the use of poetry and, and other creative devices. 
Right. Um, I actually I've been in the organization for um, close to, if not over 20 years now. Um, I don't know. I, one day I was perusing the internet and I found that organization and I was amazed because I used to use poetry as a way to facilitate um, not therapy because I wasn't um, a therapist then, but a, as, a, as a way to facilitate healing. Right. And I knew how healing, you know, poetry was for me. So when I when I came across the concept, I used to to do what then I realized was poetry therapy with the students at the school I was working um, in Norwalk then. So um, I saw the the organization and immediately contacted one of the mentors and began training with them. So. Um, I've been involved since, um, you know, in, in various ways. Um, I'm now a mentor, someone, and that, that's not through NAPT, but through the International Federation for Bibliopoetry Therapy. Okay. And so I got certified through them, and I'm now a mentor who trains other people who want to use poetry as an instrument of healing and, and personal growth. So that's the, you know, in a nutshell, my right. my involvement with it for the last 20 right. years. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I can relate to is as a domestic violence counselor, mm -hmm. I encouraged the use of expressive arts, mm -hmm. you know, in order for them to process yeah. um what the experiences were and you know one of i remember one uh situation very well where um a young lady i worked with you know i remember the first time i started working with her she wouldn't even open the shades you know because she was so uh terrified and with time um as we were doing the expressive therapy etc and putting words um uh, on paper Mm -hmm. It kind of came together for her. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, when she was leaving the um, shelter where she was, mm -hmm. um, I gave her an assignment to write a poem about who she is. And it's, mm -hmm. I am, right? Mm -hmm. and, and she had to work through it week by week. But the last time I saw her, she had her poem together mm -hmm. as to who she was. And she, she seemed prepared to step into the new life with yeah. some power and some control, knowing yeah. exactly who she was, right? So yeah. I applaud you for really doing this work. And um, yeah, you know. it's, it's, it's something, I mean, it is a transformative um, experience for most people. And, and we know that, you know, we hold on to songs, we hold on to words that have meaning to us. So in poetry therapy, we, we facilitate that by, by, you know, sharing poems and songs or fragments of stories so that people can be stilled from there, the, the material, the words in which to tell their own stories. And, and we see the difference. I have worked throughout the years, um, you know, with the elderly, with adolescents, with women who are in transition, um, with individuals in general who are in transition. And, and I, I can see uh, what it does to people when they find the way to express. That's, that's right. where the, right. the healing begins, when we can name when we can put something outside of us right. uh, and, and kind of give it texture so we can maneuver and, and change um, whatever needs to be changed and transformed. Yeah. That's beautiful. Now, as we're talking about poetry, do you have one you want to share? You share one and I share one. How is okay. that? Okay. So mm -hmm. I, I thought... Um, let me share one of mine because I think it's relevant to perhaps this, this conversation today. Um, it, began, it begins with um, the title of the poem is How Caciques Are Made. Mm 
and caciques are um, in Spanish is the name for a, a chief mm -hmm. or the head of a tribe. Right. So how caciques are made, and it begins with a quote from a, the poet Adrian Rich that says, your mother dead and you unborn, your two hands grasping your head, drawing it down against the blade of life, your nerves, the nerves of a midwife learning her trade. Mm -hmm. So that ends Adrian Rich quote. And this is my poem. My son's mother dies today. He'll be born tomorrow when round death sticks to the unique instant of giving birth, the blood that unites us will flow gloriously down the legs. I'll gladly kiss the wound as if to bless the moment. Still alive, I die joyfully, so joyful that I burned with pleasure. On a tray, I serve my son the unavoidable pain that will force him to grow robust in the anguish of being human. The unavoidable pain through which words pace back and forth like a beast, like a wild animal. In fine prayer, I plead that my boy will become the cage for the beast. We will be born into seasons of lights and shadows, vulnerable to love's embrace. We will pass through the main brain and arrive in this world with soul and senses breathing. Without needing each other, we will offer each other company. We will transcend solitude. A song dies in order to start the true beginning wisdom of the shadows and the abyss from which we will triumphantly emerge. From death will come the warmth to germinate the seed, breathing in the blood, breathing in the dead. My son's mother dies today. He'll be born tomorrow, kissed by the roar of a wild animal, bloody with opened eyes, he'll break the curse. Goddess, I will blow, blow the breath into a miracle. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. Now, uh, ooh, I want to hear yours. My heart, you know, like really, you know, uh, beat deeply. Uh, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with others. Um, and I'll share one of mine. Yes. The Magnificat in my own image. I wrote this in 2002, and I want to give a, a shout out to Dr. Irene Lazarus, mm -hmm. who uh, encouraged, you know, my poetry writing. Beautiful. Um, I was born in the month of November. As the elders describe, that is the month where if one goes through, is able to live and tell their story. Mm -hmm. I was blessed with a rich imagery of death and permanence when my birth coincided with a fixed water element as my astrological sign. I was named Ama for a girl born on Saturday and was honored with the name Isi Mensima, mm. my grandmother's name, and my soul rejoiced. Culture and tradition appeared in every fiber of my being with drums speaking to my heart. Mm -hmm. I learned that I could whisper through the wind to talk with a goddess. And she appreciated the proverbs, songs and rituals that honored her. This indigenous religion reinforced my belief that human progress brought peace and harmony in my community and my soul rejoiced. Mm -hmm. With a powerful physique, I was endowed with great love, sensitivity, mystery, and wisdom. As the eagle was introduced to accompany my journeys, I learned to love with fierce abandon. My heart opened and burned 
with passion for love and justice. And my soul rejoices for what is yet to come. Yeah. Wow, the, the poems kind of talk to each other. <laughs> right? That was perfect. And we didn't know we were going to share. No, poem, right? It just happened. That is that. amazing. Right. The we birth of a girl. This. We should do more of this. Yes, definitely. <laughs> right. I remember the dinner we read poetry, right? Uh -huh, it was yeah. wonderful. Yes, we, we must do it again soon. <laughs> right. Um, so we both come from different places, indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. um, English is our second language. Mm -hmm. And so the nuance of language, you know, how we say things. For example, um, I was thinking this morning, you know, as reflecting um, before I got out of bed. Mm -hmm. that you know when we express something like i am pleased with you we don't use the i am mm -hmm. we use like my eyes mm -hmm. are, you know <clears throat> it's almost like my eyes have taken hold of you mm -hmm. right yes and the eyes representing the gateway to the soul mm -hmm. you know so we express this in that format what can you share from your background that uh, makes language you know um really powerful and and connects all of us you know in different you know in our different understanding of life and experiences yeah you know what i'm thinking um as you say as you asked me this question I do have languages, well, it's the thing I use, right? It's my right. instrument of work. Um, but I have, I always stop, you know, with this, this issue of language, because actually the language, my mother tongue, was an imposition. You know, I, I, I came from um, a people that, that were almost exterminated by colonization. So the Arawak language, which was the language of the Taino people, um, the indigenous people of the Caribbean and the Dominican Republic where I was born, is almost inaccessible to us because with colonization, it was pushed as many of our practices was pushed away. So I have these, um, you know, I don't want to say love hate because I don't hate Spanish. I mean, it really is the language in which I um, better express myself. Um, but there is always that hesitation on, you know, how my entrance into language um, symbolizes kind of a rape, you know, a destruction uh, okay. that colonization did to us. Um, so, I think that holds true for all of us, right? Because uh, when I was in school, you couldn't learn your language beyond primary school. Mm -hmm. You had to speak English, and if you didn't, you were punished. Yeah. You know, so we we have that thread. Yes. Um, in yes. Common. Um, yeah. yeah, but I guess there is something about immersion, though, because when we think, yes, there was an imposition at the time of. Um, colonization, but then Spanish was the language that my ancestors learned to love. So I actually feel, I mean, there is a, a rhythm, there is a life, there is a spirit that mm -hmm. lives in my Spanish that I cannot, I cannot say I access equally when I'm speaking in English. Because you know, after thirty something years in this country, uh, I still you know English is that thing that still stays kind of trapped here. Um, I, when I'm speaking in Spanish, there is total fluidity. I can tell you though, but there are times you know um, I blank out of English. I mean, like you know, I can hear the words, but yeah. it, it's like I go totally blank on it. I I yeah. can't. Um, until yeah. I resettle myself and say, oh, okay, this is what was being said. Yeah. Uh, especially when I'm having a, an emotional 
mm-hmm. you know, reaction to something. So, mm-hmm. um, which brings me to back to our spiritual practice mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as essential to our wellness, right? Mm-hmm. Because all these things are connected to really who we are and mm-hmm. really finding a home base, mm-hmm. you know, within us and, and how to um, shine from there. You want to shed some light on that and how you... Yeah. I mean, language is home, mm-hmm. is, is what I'm saying. Lang- language is home. Right. Um, so for me, um, you know, I, like I said, I've been in this country for over 30 years and I do write in English by now um, with, you know, with ease. I actually write, um, feel at ease writing more than speaking English. Uh, when I'm writing, I can flow more um, than, than when I'm speaking. But um, when I want to feel home, I have to go to the Spanish because of that fluidity, because that spiritual connection to perhaps it's the great connection to the mother. Right. right? That's why we call it mother tongue. Right. So um, there is an affirmation, there is a a reassurance that that we access. And I see that when I when I um, do groups, uh, poetry therapy groups with uh, Spanish speaking people um, who don't have much access to use it. And they they all describe, you know, what the freedom that is in, in writing and, and accessing memories right. in, in their own language. Right. But it, it is essential as you talk about the mother and, you know, that it is essential that we tell the stories, mm-hmm. you know, of our mothers as well, because, you know, it, it kind of um, permeates, you yeah. know, deeply into, and, and our grandmothers for that matter, mm-hmm. uh, permeates into or shapes who we are, mm-hmm. you know, as women and mm-hmm. what we pass down yeah. you know, to the younger generation, right? So as we're talking of motherhood, um, what challenges, you know, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> firstly, um, that women face um, and, and what strategies using words, poetry can, you know, uh, can we engage in to bring healing? Yeah, right. I mean, I, without poetry, I don't know where I had been in life. <laughs> Um, you know, I always said I, I grew up in a in an island, so in the island is separate, right, and is insulated. So um, secrecy is is part of that. And when you've been colonized too, you know, there is a lot of secrecy about life and a, a, a lot of things that we don't want to name. Right. So as women, as mothers, and I, I learned a lot. Um, to speak up through my mother in a very, um, I want to say obtuse way, because she was, my mother or is a very, very strong woman. At the same time, she, she believed the status quo. So mm-hmm. she, she was silent for many years in so many ways. And her silence motivated me to speak up motivated me to write. And when I began to write, I wrote about prohibited things. I wrote about um, sexuality and my body. And, you know, I, it was a, a, a liberating force. Right. So giving women the power of words is, is the most um, powerful um, tool that we can offer. Um, right. to that and I know for me you know as a mother um, there was that um, friction when I became a mother because I had a child who was demanding of my time and that was actually quite the adjustment for me right. to give up my writing time so I wrote a lot about motherhood 
not so much from the sweetness that it is sold as, I think motherhood is overrated, <laughs> but I wrote from the perspective of what is this? Who is this little guy who has taken over my life? Right. Um, so having access to poetry and to, to kind of navigate the transition I was going through uh, was, was, you know, a, a crucial, uh, very important thing in my life. And, and, and I, I believe, you know, that for women especially, mm -hmm. it is in telling our stories mm -hmm. that we not only empower each other, but really send a message. And it's a peaceful message, right? Yeah. And harmonious message to everyone else that, you know, this is where we stand, or mm -hmm. this is the direction we're going yeah. in. So what is the pathway to creating our stories? I mean, you and I have a mechanism in place, right? For example, when I'm stressed, the first thing I think of is going to that place where I can draw something from within and put it on paper. Yeah. But for somebody who hasn't used that tool, what would be some of the strategies they can put in place to start? Yeah, to use the writing. Right. Um, well, to start by reading, I said to, to those I work with that the most important book they need to read is themselves. Mm -hmm. So is introspecting, is going in, because all everything that we need to write is it's within and it, of course it's outside, it's in the environment, it's in the ecology that surrounds us. But that ecology has to be brought in to be processed. So to see writing as an opportunity first to enter silence. Silence is 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 it's key, right? Key. We right. have to go, we have to retreat mm -hmm. inside into silence. Into there has to be a connection with solitude. Mm -hmm. uh, not loneliness, but solitude mm -hmm. to then access the, the, the well of information that's within us. And it has to be, you know, the Bhagavad Gita talks about the spiritual journey as being the journey um, that is similar to climbing the Himalayan, uh, right. where you have to train for a long time you have to create an endurance. You have to train your muscles. So the spiritual journey through writing is the same thing. It has to be done day after day, little by little, practicing, practicing, practicing. So you see something that you consider beautiful or ugly or scary, go in, process it. Talk to the body. You know, I do something... Right embodied writing, which I learned from our old professor, Rosemary Anderson, and I adapted, right. <laughs> um, I adapted it since then to, and I've been facilitating workshops, you know, embodied writing with a creative, um, you know, angle, which is a little different than what professor Anderson, um, you know, envisioned when she created um, embodied writing. But it's, it's, you know, there has to be an embodiment right. of, of the experiences uh, that has to happen. And then the transformation comes when we're able to put it in, on the page. So what I said to people is read your own book, the book you are, and um, just pay attention to the body, to the wisdom that is in the body. Right. And and talking about the wisdom in the body. Mm -hmm. in, in my culture, uh, what we do is actually from uh, childhood, you know, when you're little and they're grooming you to how to take care of your body, yeah. we have a daily ritual that right after your bath, you have to sit and really put, you know, shea butter on every part of your ah, body. That's and then, why you have that beautiful skin. Uh -huh, thank you. <laughs> And then, and then they would inspect it and tell you, ah, you missed a spot here, you missed a spot there, and stuff. 
but that daily sitting with the body yes really um the you know shares you you get in tune with the cells because mm -hmm. the cells hold wisdom yes and exactly. they talk back to you and tell you what is going on yeah. also from the inner level right 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 and, and yeah. one question i would ask my clients for sometimes is or the women that i work with is when did you stop being enchanted mm -hmm. with your own story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right because if you don't like your story who else would like i mean you have to you um, have to like your story right in the same way that you have to like the body right, right. and be scared of it that there's um, no shame yeah in any Those. story right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what teachings can we pass on to the younger generation you well, have a son i have a daughter um you know uh, what do we tell them as mm -hmm. they're growing up because they, i noticed as you mentioned earlier our mothers were silent yeah. to a point yeah to a point. and did not disseminate some of the things they could have to make as more prepared mm -hmm. you know about life in general mm -hmm. and it, you know looking to the future the people we engage uh, mm -hmm. with etc cetera, etc cetera, right mm -hmm. i always call it some life traps it's like mm -hmm. you know you have you know land, land mines places where they are not aware of yet but we've been through it mm -hmm. so what are some of the things you want to share I think it goes back to to the issue of introspecting, right? To and and I will say, I I say this to my son, um, to be you know always wide open, always alert to see what's in the surrounding, um, but also to trust that all the answers are within. Right. That there is a power within. That there is an answer for everything. That there is a a way to hold things that lives within, not outside. Um, I mean, we can go to others uh, for guidance. We can go to others for, with um, questions, but the answers are within. So the, the importance of introspecting, the importance of connecting to the elements mm -hmm. that then um, uh, allowed introspection to 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 have a life right so we know that five minutes for instance into nature there is a transformation that happens to us there is a an easiness right. Right? if you want start asking people what happened to them to kind of take notes of what happened to them five minutes into being into in in the woods and invariable people are going to notice that there is an easiness so um that's the combination of the silence that is there the quality of all the elements that are that are there and the um what it, what gets facilitated is the that introspection that that right within. And, and expression, right? You know, finding a tool, yeah. you know, so for example, as we talked about expressive arts, mm -hmm. it could be words, it could be painting, it could be music, it could be, yeah. you know, sound, um, however ways they can integrate that into their daily experiences. Right, right, right. 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 And I, you know, going back to my own son, he, he was gifted with the, uh, the art of seeing so he's a painter mm -hmm. um so he he's an artist and he, and he knows he knows how important introspecting it is in order for him to create and um i'm always amazed with him because his eyes see things that i don't see actually with all my, my years of practice and things there is something there is an um what, what would I say? There is like a, a laser focus kind of viewing that he has that right. is amazing. We, we all came with unique gifts and mm -hmm. skills and uh, 
It's amazing. And and I think, you know, the younger generation gets smarter. I don't know whether it's, but they have a whole um, access to information. Mm -hmm. um, and when I talk information, I'm talking of, you know, um, beyond what is in front of us. Right, that right. Into the intelligence mm -hmm. uh, and, and really draw something from it that we were never aware of. Yes, yes. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful about this new generation because of what you're saying. They have learned to see beyond. That's that's for sure. Right. Because we, we were brought up to see what has been structured and, and that was the way it, it was, right? Mm -hmm. They think beyond that. They're very creative and expressive that way. So Absolutely. they won't be able to function well in the current structures. And we can see it playing out right in front of us, right? Um, they're actually brilliant um, in the way they use information. It's uh, beautiful to see. Yes. So uh, as we, time is, you know, uh, I like these conversations because, you know, once you get into it, you know, you can go for a really, you know, long yeah. period of time. But uh, I know when people are, tuning in to watch, they don't want to go beyond this, you know, so uh, uh, time is money, they say. Yeah. Uh, so what is your thoughts on who a woman of power and grace is? Yeah, um, I think when I think about those two put together, mm -hmm. power and grace, um, what, what comes to mind is compassion and is the ability um, to assert, to have access to words and to intuition. So when you when you put that those all those elements together, I think you have a woman of power and grace. And when I think you know, I was thinking, um, because I know this is the, the main theme of, of your, your program, I was thinking, who are the women of grace I know? Well, you are one for sure. Oh, thank you. And then I was, I was thinking, um, one of the, the, the books that has actually saved me through the pandemic is this book written by Ruth Kinn um, is mindful of race. It's a beautiful book. And she, I don't know her personal, but just by reading her, I think she en encompasses all those things that I was saying, um, the compassion, the clear vision, the being no, no, she has no fear to name things. Right. right. And obviously she is a writer. So she has access to these, but her compassion exudes throughout the book. And she's someone who lives a very spiritual life, but it's also a life that is tied to activism, which is so crucial. It's, it's right. one of the pillars of, um, of, of um, spirituality. And then the other person, the other woman that comes to mind um, to, as, as someone who embodies power and grace is John Halifax, who is a, a Buddhist um, teacher who um, directs the Upaya Center in, in New Mexico. And okay. she is an anthropologist. She is a social activist, um, really a, a, a someone who has transformed all the spaces that she has inhabited. Right. So to me, yeah, I don't know if that's clear, but that, that, that no. is. A, um, there isn't one definition of a woman of power because there's so many different parts yeah. of who we are. Yeah. But as a whole, we have to integrate Yes. All the unique attributes, you know, from so many different places, one to enable us to transform, yeah. but two to be able to receive grace and give grace, yes. right? Yes. It has to be balanced that way. Yeah. So 
yeah, I'm, you know, I really appreciate you bringing these people up. And, and, uh, and, and also that I think is connected to what I was saying, but also the other element is the ability to embrace vulnerability. And, yes. and women of power are women who are not afraid of suffering, who are not afraid to say, ouch, it hurts, which is part of being assertive and spontaneous and compassionate towards right. ourselves so and others. Yeah, the ouch part, some of us know very well. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, it's it's uh, beautifully expressed and, you know, I really appreciate you coming on to my round table to share these thoughts. And I'm hoping that the women who really access this information could take all the nuggets, you know, of gold you've shared today and, you know, use it and open up, you know, in order to step boldly into their own lives and be able to share their own stories. So yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you so thank much. You. I, mean, I you. hope you had a lot of fun and you I know. I did, I did always. Talking to you is always so enjoyable and reassuring and energetic and all those things. Thank you, thank you. I'm you know inspired about you know all the uh, knowing people like you. Really, uh, it's really beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>